on this third episode of my series Trail Fails, instead of going through my mistakes and critiquing them, we're gonna be going over Shy. Oh, it feels like it's vibrating. This guy is a big YouTuber who typically does train surfing and exploring abandoned building videos. But in this episode, he decides to go out and do a massive ridge traverse with no experience. He makes a ton of mistakes, but he does make a few key really good decisions. I'm not here to cast shade on Shy. I really respect his big balls for going out and doing this massive ridge traverse as class four and class five uh, climbing in it with no rope, just free soloing everything. But I am gonna break down what he did wrong here so everyone can learn from it and not make the same mistakes. So first off, he's doing a ridge traverse up in Northern Slovakia on the border of Poland and Slovakia. Improvised path that I really want to try. I have not a clue how long it's going to take. I have a couple days worth of supplies in the backpack and a lot of motivation. So I do not know where I'm going to end up. I have no clue how long it's going to take me. I have no experience going through these type of terrains long distance. So he's doing this with no experience, with no trip plan. He's obviously left no trip plan with anyone because he doesn't know where he's going. And this is very ill-advised. You should get experience in the mountains, do day hikes, then start doing some backpacking overnighters, a few smaller ridge traverses, maybe get to know this area, do 15 hikes on all the different sides of this, and then go do something big like this, not just wing it out of the gate. The initial idea was to go all the way around to the other side. As you can see, this is not amateur terrain. He's going over some serious stuff and he's just winging it. Got a sleeping bag, mat, tarp, some uh, water resistant clothes, gloves, water filter, some uh, sandwiches I'm gonna eat today, bunch of energy bars, a liter of water. So right off the bat here, his supplies are pretty good. I'm impressed, especially for someone who doesn't have an experience. Now he's got one major mistake here and that's one liter of water for a big ridge traverse is not enough. Uh, he should be bringing three liters of water up there and you'll see later in this video that he's planning on going down to a lake and that's where he's gonna get more water. But when you're on a ridge like that, especially seeing this terrain, the odds of getting down there very easily are not very good, um, if possible at all. And he doesn't even know, he doesn't have any beta whether he can get off the ridge down to the water. So, you know, hedging all of that on one liter is such a bad idea. Look at this, it's all wet. So look at his shoes there. They look like they're a bit worn, but he is wearing the right kind of shoes. He has good tread on them. They do look a bit worn though. Uh, and he's dealing with terrain that it has just rained at some point. And later on, he does mention that there was a thunderstorm, I think the day before he went to do go do this. Hell yeah. I'm going to continue going here, up to there, there, to the top. That looks so sick. So right away, looking at this terrain, even without having any knowledge of it, you can just see by the loose rocks on top of the mountains means that this, this is not a stable kind of stone. These boulders up here will also be at the bottom. They're going to be everywhere, which means this, this mountain is actively crumbling. And that should be in, in your, right in the front of your mind when you're crossing something like this, because anything, not only something small, but like a huge chunk the size of like a bus could break off going across this. These rocks do look pretty solid, but some just pop out like that. So we really need to test if they're not gonna break. Climbing on something like that, that's like a spire, clearly this has been eroded for probably millions of years. And all you got left is this one little chunk in this case where he's standing. Now that whole section could just break off and fall down. Now for a situation like this, I would have gone all around to the left. I can't quite see exactly, but it looks like he could go down the grass and up this side. He doesn't need to climb on top of this thing because any one of these chunks, like where he's grabbing, this whole thing could break off. This section could break off. This whole side can break off. And it's, it's not a smart idea to climb on something like that that is so unstable. This is not like a, a sturdy piece of granite. So same goes with this block. He's putting his weight on that. He goes to step over, it snaps off. You know, he can end up the bottom as statistic. Same goes with this piece that he's grabbing onto here. So just from experience, you just don't do this kind of stuff because there's just too many times that stuff breaks off. Like this. I was about to like put my weight on it and uh, yeah. 
Okay. This whole thing he's standing on could break off, and this is very much like a cornice. If you're not familiar with a cornice, you got like a mountain peak. You've got a, the snow that blows up on top and like lands, and sometimes it it creates a big drift, and it'll stick up over the mountain. So this whole part here is snow, and if you walk out on it, this whole thing breaks off, and then you fall to your death. So the same thing can happen here with this rock he's standing on, and there's there's a there's a weight limit. It might be 100 pounds, it might be 700 pounds, or 6,000 pounds. We don't know what the weight limit of each piece of rock is, but it's <laughs> it's ill-advised to be standing on that, especially with so much broken slabs of rock all over this mountain. You should never do this. You should never double jump both feet at the same time on top of a ridge, on top of a bunch of loose, these are all loose chunks of rock. This could have easily tipped over. It can destabilize the entire top of this mountain. Um, having him go with the rocks. It can also spray big chunks, boulders down below. And later you'll see on the right side of this mountain, there's a popular hiking trail in the valley. So you can be launching these boulders down to people below. So you just, you never do that. He should have grabbed the, the rock behind him and slowly lowered himself onto those rocks and just really try to not disturb this at all. <laughs> Interesting. So what he's got there is a rope someone has left for rappelling off of this mountain. So obviously rock climbers are using this and they're climbing up with a rope and then using that to descend back down, leaving that in place. Let's see. Yeah, I think I can descend here. <laughs> yeah. Then somehow get on that. So any piece of rock he's standing on here could break off. It's just, it's, it's so dangerous what he's doing. Come on, backpack, just... You, you never, ever want to do that. All his survival gear, his food, his tent, his shelter. He's basically sleeping with a tarp, but that's his shelter. You know, if it starts pouring rain and he's freezing cold and that backpack rolls off the side of the mountain over here and all the way down and he can't get it back and it starts pouring rain. He's got no protection against the rain at all. His shelter's gone, all his rain gear, his jacket, all that stuff's gone, his food's gone. So the only thing he actually has is in his pocket uh, and Later on, you'll see his, his phone is in his pocket, so that's basically all he would have left. So you never, ever want to do that. There's different ways you can potentially, if you have to get the backpack off of your, your back to get that down, you can look through, you should ideally, if you have a little piece of paracord, I always carry a piece of paracord with me, and you can just tie that on your backpack and then slowly lower it into position so it doesn't gain momentum and just roll right off the mountain. Once again, the double the double jump, like that much weight when you drop, the the force of gravity. I'm not some scientist or whatever, but basically, I know when when you're dropping like that, you'll increase the force impact more than your body weight, significantly more landing on that rock. So instead of him being 170, 180 pounds hitting that rock, it's going to be like double or triple that, with a much higher chance of him dislodging the rock he's standing on. That's saving his life essentially so that's just that's a really bad idea to do that All right. so you can see here by dropping his backpack he lost his water and his water is only sitting in the side now let's just talk about this you should never put water in the side here this is such a vital thing uh, if you check out my other trail fails episodes the first two they all they both deal with dehydration so this strap here is not enough there's just not enough holding this water in he doesn't have a strap that goes across the top either. So if you're gonna put water there, you definitely need a strap across the top. And personally, for me, I always make sure the strap goes through something that is a part of my water bottle. So if I have a carabiner on it, or if it's a water bag or whatever it is, it's somehow physically attached to the bag so you can't lose it. And it could have easily punctured his water too. So if his bag got punctured, he would have lost all of his water. And then depending on where the puncture is, he would have a really hard time of actually keeping water. So say if it got punctured on the bottom, he'd have to rip that open and then fill up the hole to hold water upside down and he would no longer be able to properly close the water. So you see how this is, it just can spiral out of control. So what he's doing here is great, testing out the rocks. It looks like it's a piece of rock that could whole, whole slab could just break off. So it's good he's testing these pieces. But looking at this, I would have probably rather, I mean, I wouldn't be up on doing something like this, but I would have stepped over here because this is clearly a solid piece of bedrock. It's a bit moving, but it should be good. 
All right, managed to get down all of that nicely. Time to go up all of that. Now in doing stuff like this, like really scary skinny ridge traverses, I personally never do this unless I have my poles. Hiking poles, they're not just for grandpa's hiking. They allow you to extend the length of your arm. It's like extending your length of your arm by another four or five feet. So you can stick that into rocks and really use that to pivot, to get more reach. You can reach down much further because you have a pole. And in this case, he could have braced himself on both sides. It just makes it way more safe and stable and secure and it can really save your life. Huh, more ropes. Clearly this is another rock climbing route, probably off down this side from down where the uh, hiking trail starts. This looks like an absolute disaster. All of this stuff looks like just big chunks of rock that want to just peel off this mountain. Uh, you couldn't pay me to go do that. More rope, nice. Comes in very handy. Okay, yeah, that's that's pretty steep. Gonna have to go around. As you can see, this grass is all wet. My shoes are wet, and uh, there's barely any grips here. Really fast. So you can see why there's a rock climbing loop at the top there, because this is something that's not smart to descend without a rope. Uh, clearly, the climbers have that all set up because of this. This would be a lot easier without a backpack. If we get closer to the wall, maybe I should drop it again. <laughs> okay, yep. All right, you can stop now. Please. So that is probably the biggest mistake he made in this entire video. Once again, he's not just dropping it like six or seven feet like before. It goes all the way down there and it's gone past here. Now he does recover it, but it's the same thing as I mentioned. His water bag can get punctured. Maybe he doesn't have any more water by the time he finds it. Does his gear go everywhere? He actually has some like electronics on the top of his bag. And it's just like that is, it's all your survival gear. You can't drop your survival gear. If you really have to and you didn't bring a piece of paracord like I mentioned earlier, then just wear it on the front. Make it a front pack. Um, the problem with that is it limits your visibility, but it's better than doing that. If I really had to get it off my back because there's not enough space and I didn't have paracord and I couldn't see having it on the front, then I'd probably start dangling it off just one shoulder. It's a pain in the butt and it changes your weight because as you start moving around, you get this extra piece of weight hanging off of one side, but it's better than that. Um, if you have a, at least a, like a strap that goes around your waist, you can tie that really tight and just kind of rotate it to the side. So at least it's sticking off your side and not your back, get your back closer to the wall. It's, they're all not great solutions. The best idea in this situation, just paracord, tie it, lower it down somewhere. If he's going down over here, over here, just lower it to that area nice and slow so it doesn't roll away. And he needs to put the water in the bag, not on the outside. Uh, sounds like soft. That's feeling great. It's a matter of time, you know, if he does this three or four more times, he's gonna have no water. It's just gonna be leaked out all over the ground and that's it. Let's see the damage. So you can see he's got a whole bunch of electronics in the front. Like, <laughs> that's not something, you, as, as a filmmaker, I, I would never throw my bag. It's just not gonna happen. And the fact that it got stuck, look on this, the slope here, it could have easily gone down more and it would have been gone like another 500 meters down the mountain. Upwards. Okay. Okay, come on. That is like negative climbing. Okay. <laughs> so this kind of stuff, like you can see there's another rock climbing rope here. This is all like class five. We're not even, we're past hiking, we're past class four. This is definitely into the class five zone. Uh, it's just really dangerous stuff, especially with no rope up there. Cause all this rock is just clearly big slabs here that are just loose waiting to peel off. Yeah, the ropes actually kind of come in handy. Whew. Okay. So another problem with him doing these double foot drops is he might not be able to get back the way he came. And if he comes up to a big, cliff here where it literally is just a straight down wall 
then he's t he's stuck in a position where he can't get out. And if his cell phone doesn't have connection, then how is he going to get off there? Because this guy clearly didn't bring a Garmin inReach. He can't call a chopper. And if he doesn't have cell phone connection, he would be stuck with yelling down to the valley and hoping someone hears him. And then when they hike back or if they have a, a GPS device, then they can call a chopper for him. It's just a bad situation. That's why you don't want to jump down on rock like that. Because some of these he's jumping down looks like he's dropping like seven or eight feet. And there might not be a foothold to go back up. Yeah, that's, that'll be a gnarly jump. All right, plan worked. That was intense. Damn. Okay, come on. Come on. That is horrible. So exactly as I said, he get to a, a situation where it's a big cliff. So now he's got to find a way to get around this. He does get around this, but he might not get so lucky next time. Nope. <laughs> All right, so my idea is to just hang off with my leg there. So at this point in the video, this is the highest risk of death in this video. It's absolutely insane. And a lot of this, look at the where his feet are uh, placed on. A lot of this stuff is either incredibly slick or is ready to break off. Yeah, this is good enough. Well, that was surprisingly easy. So we look at this, if he had lost his water on those both those drops, like getting down here doesn't look even possible. Like a lot of this grassy slope stuff, if you try to go down that, you just slide and you'll just go and go and go and you end up breaking your arms and legs if you're lucky. So some spots, it does look doable, you can get down, but he didn't know that going into this, which is why it's so imperative that you actually have a plan, you know the terrain and you plan things out, you don't just wing it. So this is a situation where if he had two trekking poles, he could easily reach below his feet and place them in these cracks of the rocks and use that as leverage to lower his weight at a slower rate. That way you don't gain extra speed because on a big slab like this, the last thing you want to do is gain extra speed because you might not be able to stop, especially if, you're, if your shoes like his didn't look like they had perfect grip on them. They weren't fresh out of the box. I'm in the thick of it. <laughs> so he did see the clouds rolling in, but he still decided to go up into the summit. On a, a peak like this, it's, it's very ill-advised because if this thing, as you can see, engulfs the peak, it doesn't allow you to see the path down anymore. So you're at the mercy of the cloud. The cloud hangs around for the next three days. What are you going to do? And he gets lucky because the clouds end up peeling off, but you, you don't want to take that risk in this kind of situation. Now my James Peak video, I went up into a big cloud like this, which was still ill-advised because there was thunderstorms in the distance, but it was a very easy trail to follow. It was a very simple mountain, it's nothing technical like this. So I could have followed out the trail only by seeing two or three feet in front of me easily all the way back to my car. So in that situation, it's not that dangerous, but in this, it's incredibly dangerous. Where is everything? I can kind of see a little bit of the way forward. It seems doable. Can't see any more than like 30 meters ahead. I've been in clouds before, but it never gets tiring to see this. Okay. All right. So you can see he had his phone on his pant leg and almost lost his phone. If it slipped off, it would have been gone forever. It would have just been in a rock crack somewhere. He would have never found it again. Now I made a similar mistake, not quite like this, but I had my phone shoot out of my pocket when I was uh, doing uh, V2 Vermilion in Colorado. And I was just walking through the woods and what happens is if your pants get bunched up, sometimes it just creates a pinch on your phone and because of rectangular shape, it'll actually squeeze it and just 
you know, pop it right out. And that's what happened. Mine flew out into the woods when I was, I was uh, off the main trail, taking a piss in the woods and it just shot out. I got near the summit, realized I didn't have my phone, hiked all the way back down, somehow found it and went back up. So since then, I never carry my phone in my pocket like that unless it's a zipper pocket. And I recommend you do the same. So in general, the only thing you want to keep in open pockets is things you're willing to lose, whether that's a, maybe a bag of nuts or some whatever, a cleft bar or something like that that's not going to absolutely devastate you. Losing your only piece of communication with the outside world, yeah, you don't want to lose that. Nice. The clouds are clearing up. So he gets a break in the clouds and allows him to descend, but try and just think about doing this descent with no visibility or like 10 feet. It's, it would be almost impossible and you wouldn't even know which direction to go. Like you wouldn't know, is this a better route? You wouldn't even be able to see this ridge or anything here. You would just be guessing. It's, it, it's an absolute terrible situation. You can imagine if this stuck there for three days, he would be screwed. So this is another situation. If he had trekking poles, it would make his life a lot safer and potentially a lot easier. Cause what you can do is plant your pole into the grass, say behind your heel here. And since it's a metal spike, it'll go into the dirt. And then you can use the pole to lock your foot against the pole, creating torque in the grass, in the soil, thus reducing the risk of your foot sliding off this wet grass. It's just so much safer. So I'm crossing a path here. I assume this path leads all the way down to the water there. So he gets lucky here and finds a dedicated path with chains that he can easily follow down to the water, but instead just <laughs> he keeps going back up. Uh, it's weird too because it doesn't look like he's had any water to drink this entire time. So he could be getting dehydration without even noticing. It happens to me all the time. I don't think about drinking water and then I get dehydrated. By the time you get dehydrated, it's too late. You need to drink water throughout the day and it takes time for the water to get into your system. Shrine in clouds. So despite the close call with the clouds before, he's getting into it again. He had a bail point back there with that designated trail. I would have taken it if I was in this situation. You don't want to mess around with these clouds. Not sure what's going to occur in the night. Yesterday was a thunderstorm, so I want to be a bit down off the mountain so I don't get zapped. So he's up here at 5 o'clock, 5 p.m. I'm not sure what time of year this is filmed. It looks like it's either spring or fall. Based on the fact that it rained earlier and then it was only a little bit damp in some spots, but the rock was dry, I'm guessing this is probably late summer, maybe like a September-ish kind of thing. It's likely he has daylight for another two to three hours, but at this point, if you're on top of a peak like that and you got clouds, like it's time to get off the mountain and get down into the valley. So at this point, he's just taking guesses on the route because he has no visibility. He might be going up to a dead-end cliff drop for all he knows. An abyss. You can actually see the valley. Beautiful. That is steep. Some of it is moist, some of it is dry, so do my best good impression. So this kind of train is very dangerous. It's very easily to slide on wet grass like this, and there's really nothing to grab a hold of. If you start falling, you'll just gain momentum until you just start smashing your bones. You'd be lucky to be able to grab a tuft of grass and slow yourself down. For that reason, I use that trick with the pole. You stab the pole in and then push your foot against the pole so you get a good footing. This is what I did to descend peak one in Colorado. Uh, my brother and I got stuck in a thunderstorm. It, the thunderstorm was coming in pretty fast and we had to descend very quickly. So we didn't get to get to the proper place to descend the mountains. We went down something exactly like this and it was very sketchy. It was really wet, but we got down safely. You just have to use the proper like techniques. Gotta somehow head down there and then climb up there.
this is a highly dangerous, dangerous place that only very, very experienced people should be up on. This is definitely not something you should be winging. All right, those rocks went past me. I'm getting down to the water through here. So you can see he kept on pushing till 7 p.m. on top with the clouds. He keeps getting lucky breaks at the clouds open and close, giving him visibility. But now he's got about an hour before it's dark. He's up on the middle of a ridge. I mean, look at this. This is, <laughs> there's no way you're getting off of this unless you have, you know, a like hundred so meters of rope and, you know, proper way to descend a repelling device or rock climber. Still looks quite steep. Huh. Well, shit. So he's doing the right thing here. He's testing this rock. It's overhanging. It's a big slab. He realizes, yeah, this could probably break off, but really you don't want to put any weight on this, especially if you look where the, the center of gravity is on this thing, it's going to be right here. It's, this is, if you pull on this and put all your weight on this side, that's more likely if it were to break. So really you should swing your body around and really not try to pull on this side, put your palm on this side and push down in the middle to try But even doing that, this whole thing might just break off five feet below you. It's it's really a, a big gamble to do this kind of stuff. Oh, it feels like it's vibrating. Oh, it's so he does navigate that as best as possible, but as you said, it feels like it's vibrating, it's loose. It's kind of clearing up on that side. Damn. So as I said, any one of these can break off, especially once you put 100, 150 pounds of pressure and that's what he just experienced there. When moving through terrain like this, you always wanna have three points of contact. So you always have your hands and feet always on the surface and you're just moving one at a time. So you reach up, grab a new hold with your hand, then you move one of your feet, then you move one of your other feet. That way, if the, if the rock breaks off like it did right here for him, his foot is still planted on another rock and he's still holding on to two other rocks. At that point, you just have to hold, hope that both your hand holds and your other foothold don't all break at the same time. If they do, yeah, he's just gonna be at the bottom of the mountain. Well, good thing it was the last foot push off. I think I'm going to try to get down through here. So he makes an excellent decision here. He realizes that the initial mountain he was going to, the, the big one in the distance, is too far away and he's making the decision to go down before it gets dark because he's already dealing with all the cloud and then have to do this in the dark, it would be impossible. You would have to find some spot and just like build a little spot to lay down on an angle for the night. You wouldn't get any sleep. It would just be absolutely miserable. And if it starts pouring and it's rain and lightning and stuff, you might get hypothermia up there pretty easily. Yeah. So situations like that, you just really hope and pray there's no one below there. And for that reason, doing this kind of stuff, it's it's most advised to be wearing a helmet. That way, if someone above you is doing this kind of stuff and you get struck in the head with a rock, you're not gonna get killed. Hmm, wasn't the best idea. This is gonna be a different kind of challenge. I'm gonna let you pass. So instead of taking that easy bail point he had earlier in the video, where he could have just walked a path right down to the lake. Now he's having to deal with this incredibly <laughs> gnarly, gnarly down, down climb. And he doesn't have any poles. If he had poles, he could stab them in here and use those as leverage to just slowly let your weight down. It just makes it so much easier. This is a, this is a very, very difficult down climb. So as predicted, he doesn't make it to the bottom before the sun sets and it's getting dark. This is not the kind of stuff you wanna do in the dark. This is the kind of situation they end up twisting an ankle and then it makes it very difficult to get yourself out of the mountains, especially if you have 10 plus kilometers, even on a nice trail to get out is just absolutely barbaric. And for that reason, if you have trekking poles, then you can use those as a crutch to get yourself out. Without poles, you basically have to like hop or crawl. If you twist your ankle really badly or you break your ankle, you're, you're basically screwed. Yes, the water. 
So he does drink his water at some point, he doesn't show it in the video, and clearly one liter for that wasn't enough. Uh, you can see here, now he's got to set up camp in the dark, and you'll see he's cowboy camping, so he's just going to throw his sleeping bag on the ground, and he needs to find a place to tie a tarp over top, which is a, <laughs> a horrible thing to try to do in the dark like this in an unknown terrain, and there's no designated camp spots. 2012. So yeah. Close to ground than it is, but there is space inside. I've got my food here, backpack there. Try to wait it out. So the fact there's blueberries tells me this is probably in late August or early September that he did this hike. And the fact he can cowboy camp like this out and without a you know full cover, big sleeping bag, all that kind of stuff. Okay, new plan. The sky seems to have cleared up for a bit. I don't really want to sleep on these blueberries. Plus the tarp setup is very, very not great. So I scouted around a bit. I actually got lost for a bit, but I uh, found my way. I built this little rock tower as one anchor point, And then the second one, it's good. So I like his decisions here. He quickly set up a camp because it was raining just so he had some protection, the rain goes away, he finds a better spot. Now he makes a huge mistake here. He leaves his camp, and I think he goes out to get water or whatever, and he loses where his camp is. He doesn't even know where his camp is because it's so dark, and it takes him a long time to find it, and he gets freaked out. This is something you don't want to do. Um, this doesn't happen if you are in like a, a designated camping kind of area with trails and all that, because you just follow the trails back in the dark, but when you're backcountry camping like this, you really need to either leave a, like a line of cairns or stacked up rocks to follow your way back to your camp. Look for very noticeable rocks or distinguishing features in the landscape, whether that's a bend in the river, is there a big boulder or something you'll be able to see within 10 or 15 feet, however, however big your light source is. It looks like he's using a light that's attached to his GoPro, so it's not that bright. It's more of like a wide floodlight, which is good for filming, but it doesn't push very far. It's not a spotlight like in a headlamp. Losing his camp with all his his gear would have just been devastating, especially if it started pouring rain. Okay, I'm all snuggled in. Okay, there should be rain according to the forecast. For so he did make a good decision here by checking the forecast and downloading that before he left. Barely slept. Not for long. When it comes to sleeping in the woods, if you're not experienced, it's gonna take some time to figure out what exactly you need to feel comfortable sleeping in the woods. Some people, like me, I like to have a tent. I can't cowboy camp like this because I feel too exposed that a cougar can just reach in and grab me or a bear. I need to feel the false protection of a tent to actually be able to sleep. Uh, some people need big uh, sleeping pads or big pillows or bringing a full-size pillow or whatever it may be. Everyone's got their own thing. Psychological reason, I guess. So in his case, he built this little rock wall. I think it looks pretty nice. Until the peaks at the very end, I'm gonna look around and see what are my options, see how I feel, and decide where I'm going from there. So this is exactly what you wanna do. You can have a plan, but it's good to alter your plan based on how you're feeling. You don't wanna just push, 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 and get yourself into a bad situation. <laughs> Going to try to get to that peak, the smaller one. Yeah. So seeing these clouds roll in, immediately I would be like, okay, there's definitely no summiting going on here, or you can at least wait an hour if you have the time and see what the clouds do, but you definitely don't want to go up into that gnarly kind of stuff with these kind of low clouds. <sighs> Yeah, I'm a, <laughs> I'm a bit tired, I'm a bit tired. I pushed myself, I can chill up here a bit, enjoy the view, start getting down. So he makes a, a really good decision here. He switches from his original plan of doing that horseshoe and he realizes he's too tired and he's just gonna cut it here. It's, it's not, there's no problem with calling it. It's a hard thing to do, especially when you get that summit fever and you're going up there and you wanna bag the summit, but you gotta listen to your body, look at the weather, look at the temperature outside, just look at all the factors. You know, if you get a little sprain in your ankle, like, eh, it's okay. And it's like, no, maybe it's better to turn around while you can still walk on that ankle because it'll get worse and worse and worse throughout the day. And just like that, I am out. 
So he successfully makes it out unscathed. It's a very entertaining video. I'll link it up here on the end. Uh, I really enjoyed watching it. It made my palms sweat, but there was a bunch of mistakes here. So hopefully we can all learn from them. And if Shy, if you see this, hopefully there's no hard feelings. Uh, highly uh, respect. He got big balls going and doing that. If you guys enjoyed this episode, be sure to subscribe. I've got plenty of adventure videos of my own if you want to check out. Until next one, have a great day.